Benzene is everywhere. We know the, you're living in a city, you're exposed to benzene from car exhaust fumes, from off-gassing in, in your home furniture. So it's a really good marker for that as well. There was a 60%, 6-0% increase of benzene in the urine within 24 hours after drinking this broccoli sprout or the sulforaphane ingestion um, in the participants in the study. That's a pretty, pretty big increase of how much more toxins you can eliminate just by changing your diet. This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass, these are the themes we are exploring. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash BE legacy. See you there. So there's this phenomenon that we see when someone is being exposed to a chemical or environmental pollutant over and over again, and that is every time they encounter it, their symptoms tend to worsen, but they tend to be consistent. Think about drinking milk when you're not necessarily someone who does well with dairy or walking through the perfume aisle in the mall. Generally, as we increase our burden of exposure, our reactions become more and more intense. In a world where our environment is increasingly creeping into our cells, the incidence of these types of symptoms in our offices are increasing on an almost daily basis. Whether it is thyroid or skin or other chronic health issues, the environment in which you expose yourself is frequently to blame. My guest today, Dr. Aviad Algez, is a naturopathic doctor and environmental investigator. He owns a clinic in Toronto called Environment Clinic, and he is an expert at assessing for and treating environmental exposures. Now, many of you might think that these are the individuals who are chronically unwell. These are the people who have been complaining for years that the environment is making them sick. What most of you would probably be surprised to hear is that many of you are walking around all the time with environmental symptoms that can be cleaned up for you easily, but most importantly, could lead to long-term chronic health conditions that could be devastating for you and your family. Simple things like brain fog, endocrine disruption, autoimmune conditions, a lot of these can be traced back to exposures. And this is something that Aviad and I got into with great detail today. It is my pleasure and honor to finally have him on the podcast, Dr. Aviad Elgaz. Dr. Aviad Elgaz, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure uh, having you here, and I'm excited to get into a topic that is something we're both really passionate about and something I don't think uh, gets spoken about as frequently as it should, and that's environmental medicine. Can you take us really quickly, what is environmental medicine and and why should we care? So environmental medicine is uh, a field of medicine that focuses on everyday exposure, uh, chemicals, uh, toxins, such as, you know, mold toxins, um, if chemicals such as solvents, VOCs, pesticides, metals, etc., that people are exposed to on a regular basis uh, that does have an effect on their, their health and their physiology. Uh, you know, there is a field of medicine, the uh, occupational medicine that we hear about, you know, people working in the industry who are exposed to chemicals, to solvents, to plastics, and so on. Uh, but this is an environment medicine. This uh, environment medicine is specifically for the um, average everyday person that is exposed to these, uh, not perhaps one, two, or three of these uh, toxicants at a high level, or a combination of all of these at a low, uh, low chronic um, dose, 
and they're having an additive effect affecting their neurological system, their immune system, uh, their mitochondrial function, um, or their hormone uh, uh, system, like all the uh, famous hormone disruptors that we hear about, like BPA and plastics. Well, and I will say too, the reason I wanted to talk about this and, and get into it on this podcast in particular, because our audience are not people who are chronically unwell, but I, I find that I get people in my office very frequently who are executing at a high level and they're complaining of things like, you know, I've got this chronic cough or I just get this brain fog or, or this thyroid mm. condition, but I have no family history. And what's so interesting about these cases is that so many of them, uh, these individuals are, are exhibiting patterns of environmental exposure. And so I really do believe that this is relevant uh, to so many people. What I'd like to know is, how did you get into this? Like you're a naturopathic doctor, but how did environmental medicine become something that you're particularly passionate about? Well, ever since I was in school, I've always had a, an interest in toxicity. Uh, and then when I graduated, um, I sort of jumped right into, you know, starting my own clinic, my own practice of two colleagues of mine, and sort of just jumped right into, you know, uh, focusing on, on anxiety, depression, um, a lot of a lot of general medical health concerns, and I haven't really explored the field of environmental medicine at this point. And then, um, when, I, when I graduated, that was sort of you know my my schooling years. I was top in my class. Um, I was always getting the the awards, and whether it be in um, university or in actual school, and I started to get quite sick in the sense of brain fog, low mood, depression, focus towards the end of my, of my um, schooling. And then when I graduated, same thing, it just sort of kept going and going. And I started exploring it. I started exploring all these options as what's going on. I did all the treatments that we can do. I did all the tests, saw a lot of, my, of our colleagues, saw a lot of our you know, mentors, and nothing really worked, uh, except for maybe a little bit of cleansing here and there. And then what happened was about five years after, uh, or so maybe three to five years after, I, I decided to go ahead and jump into environmental medicine and um, take Dr. Walter Kurnian's course. And you know him and now our colleagues know him. He's sort of our mentor and it's sort of the, the what we call the, um, you know, the father of environmental medicine uh, for, uh, for the public and for naturopathic medicine and took his course. And within you know, the first day or two or three of just going through that very dense amount of material, realized how much of my experience was actually related to exposures that was never addressed. And uh, did some of the basic protocols and treatments, and within a couple of weeks, I went back to a 10 out of 10. Felt better than I have in you know 10 years, and I started applying it to my patients as well, the ones that didn't respond as well as they should have, and they just completely turned around. And that's when I realized, you know, this is what I was missing. This is what my patients were missing. It's um, when you start to get really into it, you realize. This is not uh, some small little field of medicine on the side. This is something that's core to medical uh, treatments and diagnoses, whether you're a medical doctor or a naturopath. You know, these, these chemicals affect our thyroid, they, they affect our neurological systems, uh, they affect our hormones. So there are so many conditions, conditions that are you know, ev everyday things, like you mentioned, thyroid, fatigue, brain fog, um, hormone disruption that just affects people here and there in their daily functioning that we don't even realize are affected by these um, everyday exposures. And we're doing all these different treatments, different tests, and until you actually get right into it and see it, it it's, it's almost everywhere. And it's sort of the missing link for, for medicine. And that's really what drove my passion, uh, seeing how much better I got, seeing how much better my colleagues have gotten when I helped them out and my patients. And I, I agree with you that it is this missing link and it's pervasive. And uh, I think we are naive to think that we can maneuver our way through a world on a daily basis and somehow escape uh, the effects of these things that bombard our body over and over again. And I alluded to this at the beginning that I see these patterns with patients where I'm like, oh, this is just such a, a classic exposure mm -hmm. issue. Can you talk a little bit about what those patterns are? look like so there's certainly symptoms but there's like mm -hmm. re-exposure patterns that i think some people will listen to this and go oh my gosh maybe there's something i'm being exposed to exactly yeah so there there's two ways to approach this so i'll start with the sort of the one primary way 
you can look at them as individual chemicals, you know, like what does, you know, mold exposure look like? What does uh, heavy metals specifically, you know, looking at the different metals, mercury toxicity versus lead versus pesticides and so on, or even just the basic idea of total body burden. And the one that applies to a lot of people um, mostly is this idea of total body burden where uh, we are bombarded with, you know, um, we're born, uh, I think is the, the research has been done uh, a lot with these chemicals and we're born about 160 to 200 different known toxicant chemicals um, in cord blood, you know, they measure the, the blood of, um, for, from newborns in the cord. And there's that many chemicals that we're exposed to from um, in utero and then afterwards. So there is this uh, cumulative, cumulative effect and additive effect of multiple chemicals and they generally cause a lot of oxidative stress. They interfere with the mitochondria and they interfere for our ability to uh, just dysfunction normally. So some of the primary symptoms that we see is uh, fatigue. That's an obvious one. A lot of people have fatigue for a variety of reasons, but whether it's a fatigue directly due to mitochondrial disruption from the chemicals, which is our energy uh, production, our nuclear power plants, our cells, whether it's um, the chemicals interfering with our thyroid and actually suppressing our thyroid function, causing fatigue, or our neurological system causing more of a depression type of a fatigue, um, or just a total body burden of just being toxic. You know, our liver, our bodies just um, can't deal with it. Um, and then what happens is another symptom that we see is brain fog. And um, the, when it gets a little bit more extreme, a little bit more significant, it's, their big red flag is multiple chemical sensitivity. And these are the, the people who start to realize that they have a heightened sense of smell. Um, you know, they're like, nobody believes them that they can smell this, this, this thing that's so far away where it's such a small amount of, of a scent. They are reactive to perfumes sometimes, reactive to solvents, to cleaners, um, anything that used to bother like, that, that bothers them, whether they get like a bit of an aversion to it or an itchy throat or a shortness of breath. Those, those are sort of the, the big ones when you have this total body burden. And really we can go into individual, you know, toxicants or, or toxins like mold where it affects something like congestion, a very common one, a, a current cough. Um, but you really have to go into the total body burden and then specifically try to figure out what is, which system is affected by which toxicants in their system. But fatigue, brain fog, um, multiple chemical sens sensitivity, and uh, just sub-functioning in general is um, almost universal across the board. So why is it that some people are more susceptible than others? The main reason, there's, um, there's two main reasons I can look at. One of them is, is genetics, and that's one of the most important ones. Um, we all know that different people can tolerate you know, different toxins, uh, such as, um, you know, let's say, alcohol, a very common you know, toxin that we you know, willingly uh, ingest in our society. Uh, some people can drink a lot more. Some people can drink a lot less. And they get um, very different effects from the toxic effects of alcohol at different dosages. Um, another um, very simple example is mold. For example, if you have a house full of uh, you know, five people living with mold and it's full um, of black mold or white mold that is known, you know, you can diagnose it through mycotoxins in the urine. You can have a uh, building inspector to come in to find the mold and they remove the mold and they get better. In that situation, the very, very common um, example of that is two or three of the five people are usually presenting with significant mold symptoms such as fatigue, cough, brain fog, um, neurotoxicity, depression, maybe anxiety. And one or two of those people uh, that live there have completely no symptoms whatsoever and they're thriving and they're doing great. And this is a very common thing that happens in our society with multiple chemicals, even pharmaceuticals. Some people tolerate pharmaceuticals at a much lower dosage versus higher. They have different side effects. And it really, really comes down to genetics. How well can you uh, process and detoxify and clear these pharmaceuticals and these toxins? And um, and, and how does your body react genetically to the inflammation from these toxins? Are you very reactive to these things or do you have a very um, good, strong um, antioxidant internal system? So we can test the genes for that. The other primary component, so other than genetics, for why some people react very differently than other people in the same workplace or in the same home, is total body burden. So that comes back to what I was talking about before. 
what else are you exposed to? You know, are you exposed to mold at home? Are you exposed to a little bit of solvents? For example, if you're a dental hy um, dental hygienist um, and you're wor working with uh, disinfectants all the time, cleaning the um, the tools with um, uh, solvents, the things that have things like xylene in the in there, which are petroleum compounds that you're breathing in. And also, do you have a hobby that you're a painter or maybe a job that you're a painter as well? And these things all add up. And if you have a big total body burden, all of a sudden one person um, moves into a new house with you know, three out of four people and they're renovating and there's major construction and then they get sick. But the other people in the same house don't have the same burden. They don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't have that job. And that, and that moving into that new house with the off-gassing, that new home smell, doesn't push them over the edge. Just not the straw that brought the camel's back. So the combination of these uh, different, uh, our different genes, we're all individuals and our ability to detoxify. And what is your base? What is your foundation? What do you come in with as a total body burden before that last little bit, you know, that comes in, last chemical toxin that comes in and breaks the camel's back is the biggest reason why one person experiences a significantly different amount of symptoms or reactions to uh, to toxicants where other, other people could be completely fine with it. And so how do we assess that total that total body burden? Because I feel one of the challenges with environmental medicine is that people are, are genuinely suffering. And sometimes it's really difficult for us to validate that. Um, but it's, it's, it's incredible for these people when they actually have some testing and we come back and we are like, look, look at all of the things that are existing in your system right now that are compromising your health. There's just the sense of relief for them. What do you typically do to evaluate that for people from a testing perspective? Yeah, so from a testing perspective, we can actually look at a variety of toxins and toxicants. And actually, let me um, just uh, give, give some definitions here uh, between the word toxins and toxicants, because it's something that the public and even uh, medical professionals don't uh, differentiate between the two. Um, and it's just important because that's, what, that's how I talk. Um, and that's, what how, um, that's how toxicologists also talk about this. Toxins are things that are, are chemicals that are being released compounds from living organisms, such as biotoxins from things like Lyme, um, you know, infections or other like tick-borne illnesses or other infectious bacteria or mold, mycotoxins. And then toxicants are um, environmental exposures that are synthetic or things like um, you know, heavy metals, some of the chlorinated pesticides, uh, plastics, phthalates, etc. So uh, back to your question. We can actually test for a variety of these toxins or toxicants, such as heavy metals. We can look at them in the blood. We can look at them in the urine to compare, you know, what is your uh, total body burden in, sense, in the sense of current exposure versus long-term buildup of these uh, heavy metals. We can look at um, organophosphate pesticides, the commonly sprayed pesticide and produce in the urine, BPA, plastics. Uh, we can look at even things like PCBs and uh, chlorinated pesticides. These are the ones that were banned back in the 70s, 80s, and they're, they're definitely persistent. They're still in the environment. They're still concentrated in certain foods like seafood um, and fish, and we can test for that as well, and we store these in our fats, and we can see them in the blood. We can look at mycotoxins for mold. Um, we can look at parabens as well, which are certain ingredients that are in our personal care products. Um, and so on and so on. So there is a huge list of, of chemicals that we can look at and sort of get a, get a feel of what is the, whether there is something that they're exposed to right now or, for example, off-gassing. You know, if, if you're exposed to, um, again, renovated home that's affecting you, we can look for the off-gassing such as benzene, you know, um, possibly xylene, styrene, ethyl benzene. These are things that might be off-gassing for some compounds um, that you're breathing in and we can see it in the blood. And if it's in the blood, this is current exposure for some of these uh, to uh, toxicants. And you know for sure it's kind of like blood alcohol level. If you, know, if you get pulled over and you check your blood alcohol level and you have a, a certain number of it uh, and it's pretty high and you have symptoms of alcohol, you're dizzy, you're kind of walking off, walking that that's right. The, the police is never going to believe you saying you never drank. You, know, you have the symptoms, you have it in your blood, it matches. Same thing with these toxicants. We can actually do the blood test and sometimes it matches really well. You know, they have these toxins in their blood or in their urine. They have the symptoms and, um, and then they have the exposure. We can find it in their work, in their environment, in their history. And when you triangulate it that way and, and you present it to the patient saying, this is your symptoms, this is when you were exposed, this is what we can see now, it really clears up the picture after, you know, they've been searching for 
months, sometimes years, trying to figure out why are they still chronically sick? Yeah, it's 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 such a challenge, all of these pieces coming together. And really, f- for the average person who's like, oh, gosh, like, how do I even start? It's it's such an incredible resource to have someone like you there. Are there things that when we're looking at exposures, like what are the most common things people are exposed to? Because there's the weird ones if they've got weird hobbies or some solvents or some mm-hmm. some childhood exposure because they grew up on a, a non-organic farm. But like, what yeah. do you see in practice as being the most common culprits for people? Yeah, so looking, just looking at, you know, living in the big city, uh, we're even not even the big city, but, you know, where, where we practice in Toronto, one of the biggest, uh, that there's two big ones that I see over and over again that are affecting uh, people's health. So I would say that more than 50% of the, uh, more than 50 to even 70% of my patient base that come in with these kind of chronic um, conditions or even these, again, there could be mild, like I said, brain fog or something small, or it could be more significant where they can't work and they're not functioning well, neurological symptoms. The two biggest uh, exposures are um, mold and solvents and off-gassing uh, from VOCs. So those are the really two big ones. Mold is somewhat pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. And the most homes, you know, have basements, have mold. And the real concern is, like it would it, be about you know forty to sixty percent of the homes will have mold, even more. And the question is, how much mold do they have? What species of mold do they have? Is it a real? Is it actually a really con- big concern for them? What are their what are their genetics and what else are they exposed to? So it's something that's so um, pervasive there that if you just have a combination where somebody starts getting this total body burden, they they have these poor genetics. At some point, the mold will start to, after five years, after you know, after after well, after a few months, depending if it's really moldy, the house they moved into, that they don't realize it, you can't smell it, you can't see it a lot of the time, it's kind of hidden, and then they start developing symptoms after a few months or after a few years of living there, and that's a big one that I see often. Solvents, uh, which a lot of people are not familiar with that term, solvents. Uh, the best way to really describe them are uh, anything that. Off gases. If you can smell it uh, from those like, like varnishes, paint fumes, uh, new car smell, cleaners, we're exposed to solvents way, way more than the average you know person or doctor realizes. They're everywhere, uh, and I want to give you. I give you one very simple example that's really interesting. Um, even how common this is, and people don't realize this. There was, um, so the numbers here, I don't remember the exact details, but, but maybe about 10 years ago or more even, I think that so there was, um, uh, I think it's like 60 minutes or a 20, 20, whatever, 20 minutes um, you know, TV show where they were assessing the, uh, the quality of, of the wood, the wood floorings that they were getting uh, from China. So this is for Home Depot, I believe, and Lowe's. Uh, they were getting, you know, their floors from different areas and there was, there was a source from China. And what they found out is that you know, when you when you install new floors, you, you have that smell. You know, you smell the new floor, it's off gases. That's normal for three months to a year. And then a lot of it's supposed to stop off gassing. Well, the reason that there, there is off gassing is the varnishes, but also the, the, the glue that is used to piece together these uh, engineered wood floors. And they, if they use the wrong glue, what ends up happening is it off gases a lot of formaldehyde and benzene and actually a, a bunch of other compounds too, petroleum compounds, but they really measure formaldehyde and benzene because these are known, you know, carcinogenic compounds um, and they are definitely neurotoxic, et cetera, et cetera. So they were, did this investigation they found that they even, I think it was up to a few years, between two and five years later, these wood floors were causing uh, dangerous levels of formaldehyde and benzene in the homes after they were installed, and they're wondering what's going on. Like this, this is not healthy. It's not safe. And they found out that they were they were actually you know mislabeling using they were using the wrong uh, glue that they were claiming they were using there, and they were using ones that were not made for human you know consumption use for home for for home use. So people were exposed to these high levels of formaldehyde and benzene for many years after their renovation. So th- th- this is a very common source of these kind of solvent-like compounds that are um, consistently in our homes uh, and we clean with them and we have mattresses that off gas them, et cetera. And, and they're causing neurological symptoms for uh, a lot of my patients. Of course, not everyone, because some people can tolerate them, but for a lot of our patients, they, they, it is solvents that is, um, turns out to be a very common source of their symptoms. Are there things we can do in our house to decrease the, the, the presence of solvents 
in the air? Are there plants? Are there are there air filters? Are there things that you recommend? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the best things you can do is if your house is off gassing, if it's a new renovation, or even just you know using cleaners, etc. One of the main things you can do is even just open your windows. You know, get the recirculate your air. Maybe open all your windows for about ten minutes, maybe two or three times a day, and then close them up again. Depending where you live, you know, you don't. If you live in a city, you're gonna get the air pollution from the outside. There's a lot of other compounds that we don't want, but you can get. You know, you wanna. You don't wanna get that Ziploc bag effect where you're closing down um, the house and they're just concentrating in there. So by opening things up, letting it recirculate. Um, that makes a big difference. And then on top of that, you can get a good quality air filter. So when your windows are closed, you can get an air filter that has a um, high amount of activated carbon, um, activated charcoal. And that is the main component that binds the, um, that binds the, the solvents, the VOCs. It's not the HEPA filters, and it's not the you know ionizers or the electrical electrostatic filters and so on. Um, it really is the activated charcoal. There is another compound in there that's very good. It's called uh, uh, potassium um, permanganate, I believe, or permanganate. Uh, that's another one that's usually combined in some of the higher end air, air filters. But that is very very highly recommended. So you would um, filter the air to reduce that, that load um, throughout the whole day and while you sleep in your bedroom and you will open the windows once, twice a day, really get the air to, to recirculate. And that, that, that can make a huge difference. The other thing is, you know, stop using compounds, uh, cleaners and so on that, that off-gas these solvents because uh, there are in these cleaners. So if you go to your health food store and you buy really good, clean, you know, pre preferably unscented cleaning products, that will significantly reduce your your load of solvents, you know, um, and in your everyday use, for example. What do you clean your house with? Um, so pretty much anything. To, uh, the, without mentioning brands, because I actually just go to the store and I buy different brands to try them out. Um, I go to the store and I buy anything that is really unscented in a health food store. Uh, you, you, you can go look. There is ones that are really good and ones that are not so good. But in general, health food stores will have a better selection of anything else you can buy at your regular, you know, uh, your regular store that you would go buy your cleaners. Um, if you go to ewg.org, so uh, Environmental Working Group Group .org, org, they actually have a really good list for the public where you can pop in, you know, the cleaners you're using or uh, different ones you might see at the store. And they even have a scanner, I think, that you can scan in, you can scan the barcode at the store and it, it shows up with a rating of, you know, one to 10 of how toxic that particular product is. And it goes into individual uh, ingredients in that, in that list. And it tells you this ingredient has this research that is toxic against, you know, neurotoxicity or against uh, developmental concerns of a level of seven or a level of two toxicity and so on. Um, and it's a very quick way to educate yourself um, of what to to um, to use for your personal care products, from what you put on your skin, as well as to what you clean your home with, but but really that that's my best advice is for my patients is um, get the ones that are unscented, you know don't um, don't add anything extra you don't need. So um, if you don't need to add, you know let's say the the fabric softener. Uh, to your to laundry detergent. To no one laundry. needs to add that. I Nobody will, needs to add I will that. throw that in yeah. there. <laughs> so you just don't do that. You know, if you don't need um, your dryer sheets, just get some dryer balls and just use the dryer balls. They work actually really, really well. And um, the, the, this is the number one thing you can really start to improve your health is really start to cut out these everyday um, exposures that are just adding up and adding up and adding up to your total body burden. Yeah, it's in, it's it's rarely the big thing you were exposed to once or twice or maybe once or twice a year. That's the problem is the things you're exposed to in small amounts every single day. And I, mm -hmm. I use this I use this all the time in the podcast. I say consistency builds the canyon. So we really do get obsessed as NDs with about the things that you do all the time versus mm -hmm. the things that happen a few times a year. So certainly doing an audit on on the, the care products that you stick on your body is important mm -hmm. um, and, and your home cleaners. And, and yes, I will say, listen, I have three, I have three kids. They're two, five and seven. I don't use anything in my uh, washing machine that has scents. I don't use heavy duty laundry detergent. I don't use fabric softener. I don't use dryer sheets and my entire family is clean. 
It's important to recognize what we are used to using versus things we have to use um, because decreasing those things really matter. I just wanted to throw that in there because I know, you know, we both know how people work, right? We throw these ideas out to them and then they're like, ugh, this doesn't really affect me. But it, you know what? It might affect your spouse. It might affect your your kids. And frankly, it might be affecting you and you just never put never put and, two and two and together. you know what? I'm going to give one really good example to, to continue that thought. You know, let, let's talk about how these things really do affect us. Um, again, we all know about the big exposure. Let's just say there is a big mold exposure or somebody's working with painter, you know, with your painter and you're exposed to paints all the time. These ones are obvious and they're obvious for some people, but they're not obvious for others. It might be, you know, hidden for them, eventually it hits them. But let's look at this everyday exposure. You know, I want to use the example of smoking, you know, smoking or drinking. You know, we, we know that smoking, you know, drinking can cause heart disease, right? And it's proven without a doubt. We know it causes oxidative damage. Um, it, it causes inflammation to the um, endothelial lining, to the, heart, to the arteries, right? Um, and then what happens is we know it's a long process. Somebody can smoke for 10, 20, 30, 50 years and have a bad lifestyle and so on. And then they might, you know, get heart disease, have no symptoms. And then eventually at the age of 50, 60, they may get a heart attack. They may get some significant cardiovascular symptoms. And then, you know, they may say, like I said many years ago, well, how can it be my smoking? You know, I've been smoking for 20, 30, 40 years. So if that was really affecting me, then I, I would have had symptoms beforehand. But we know better. We know it's a slow, gradual, you know, chronic degeneration, um, um, oxidative stress causing damage to our cardiovascular system. That's a very obvious one. The exact same thing applies to these chemicals. I mentioned the idea of neurotoxicity, the toxins that are affecting our neurological system, hormone disruptions, um, immune toxicity. So imagine that we're exposed to these chemicals from our personal care products, from air pollution, from you know, living in a city, from pesticides for that we're eating in our food. These things are causing wear and tear very slowly or fast sometimes, depending on your genetics. But for the average person, they're having very slowly in the background over many years. And the neurologic system just starts to wear down and wear down. And eventually, all of a sudden, a person might get depression. Um, you know, uh, they may get Parkinson's. They may get um, hormone uh, uh, the disruption and so on, or thyroid disruption. But it's happening slowly in the background. Uh, Parkinson's is the, is the classic poster child of environmental toxicity, where it's a long, gradual the, um, the disruption and, and, and destruction actually of certain, certain areas in a particular part of the brain that after 20, 30, 50 years of these exposures, if they're high enough, uh, will, will cause Parkinson's. But that's a big obvious one. But what about the small ones, as you mentioned, uh, cognitive decline, brain fog, uh, all these, um, all these uh, thyroid disruptions? Uh, these or tremors even a little bit, for example, these things are just happening in the background over 20, 30, 40 years. So the person that might say, I've been living in the moldy house. Yeah, I have mold, but I've been living here for 10 years and 20 years. Why am I all of a sudden getting symptoms? It's because it was affecting you in the background all this time. And eventually enough is enough. And there's enough damage that you start presenting with neurological symptoms um, or whatever that or, or, or immunological symptoms and so on. And that is the big, big missing uh, link and how we need to perceive these toxins, whether again, whether you're the average person living your life trying to enjoy it, or whether you're a practitioner trying to help um, your patients, you have to realize that don't look for the big, big exposure as uh, all that you want to find them. But for a lot of people, look for the small ones and how many years, how long have they been smoking? How long have they been, you know, uh, renovating? Do they flip houses for a living? Is that their hobby? Do they buy houses, live in them, flip them? And they're living in a constant renovation for 10, 20 years. And that's a major solvent exposure for those people. You're scaring me, Aviad. I'm moving into my renovated house in four weeks. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. I did the same thing about a half year ago. And unfortunately, I actually did start to experience some significant symptoms because I was forced accidentally to live in there while we were renovating before we moved into the condo. Some situation happened there and we lived for like three, four weeks while they were still renovating. And even with everything I was doing, I started to actually... Uh, significantly present with some symptoms um, that, you know, luckily I was able to tolerate them and to clear them. But if, if it was my patients, the ones that are very sensitive, if they moved in there, I can just see how much worse they would get and it would be a major flare up for them. So how do we, how do we clear these things? We talked about air filters, but what can we actually do to decrease the burden in our bodies? 
Yeah, so number one rule, as you just mentioned, is avoidance, right? So we just talked about that. You want to stop the ingestion of these things. You want to stop breathing them in. You want to stop uh, getting them in through your skin. Once you do the best that you can, you know, we're not trying to live in a bubble. It's impossible. But once you do the best that you can, the next part is to support your detox pathway. So there are two main categories of toxins or, or toxicants that we want to look at. One of them are the persistent ones, and the other ones are the non-persistent. So the non-persistent toxicants are the ones that your body can clear rapidly. So these are ones like solvents, the ones that are off-gassing that we just talked about, modern-day organophosphate pesticides that are used in the produce, some, some heavy metals actually, like aluminum or arsenic, they clear your body rapidly within days actually. So what you do is if you just stop their exposure, you don't have to worry about getting them out of the body. The problem is, is that it's very almost impossible to stop the exposure for all of these non-persistent pollutants. That's like the majority of our exposure just by living life in this world. So whatever we are exposed to on an ongoing basis, we want to enhance those detox pathways to get them out of the body. So we, we can do you know genetic testing and see which pathways are, are slow, which ones are fast. And we can actually speed up those pathways if that, that is a concern for somebody. We can take a lot of antioxidants. So a lot of these toxins cause oxidative um, stress in a variety of, uh, of areas, including our mitochondria, for example. Um, so any kind of high amounts of, of antioxidants can significantly help you to buffer the effects of these chemicals, as well as to help you clear them out of the body. A major antioxidant and detoxifier in our, in our body is glutathione. Um, a lot of your listeners are probably aware of glutathione. A lot of doctors are aware of glutathione. It's very popular. It's the primary detoxification molecule in our body. It deals with a majority of our toxins. You know, there are many, many things that can, our body does to eliminate toxins, different pathways, different chemicals that can be cleared. Uh, but glutathione is the big one. So anything we can do to enhance glutathione production. So there is supplements that we can uh, that are precursors. You know, certain things like um, N-acetylcysteine, um, selenium, certain amino acids. Um, other than the NAC, sulfur compounds, broccoli. Eating a really good amount of broccoli or broccoli sprouts is really good to enhance your detoxification pathways. So, so these are just some examples of everyday simple things that we can do, we, working with your doctor, working with some of the things that you're doing in your diet to really enhance the detoxification pathway. Actually, on that note, let me give you a really impressive uh, study that was done at John Hopkins University. So it, that applies to your question. So John, the majority of research on detoxification through sulforaphane, which is one of the primary compounds that is uh, produced in broccoli or broccoli sprouts or the brassica family of foods is done through John Hopkins University. And this chemical sulforaphane or this compound doesn't exist naturally in there. You have to crush the broccoli. You have to eat it raw. You can't cook it. If you cook it, you destroy an enzyme that's in there that is supposed to activate another compound in there to make this uh, very famous compound sulforaphane. But so, so when you do this, when you just make a broccoli smoothie or a broccoli sprout smoothie, uh, they, they actually gave it to their participants and they gave them a really good amount of sulforaphane in the broccoli smoothie and they measured how much benzene was coming out of their urine within 24 hours. And the reason that they're using benzene is because glutathione does clear solvents and it's a really good uh, marker to look at benzene of how much is coming out, how much is enhanced based on this test. But also benzene is everywhere. We know the you're living in a city, you're exposed to benzene from car exhaust fumes, from off-gassing in, in your home furniture. So it's a really good marker for that as well. There was a 60%, 6-0% increase of benzene in the urine within 24 hours after drinking this broccoli sprout or the sulforaphane ingestion um, in the participants in the study. That's a pretty, pretty big increase of how much more toxins you can eliminate just by changing your diet. Well, and the other thing I'm... I'm curious about as well is the use of uh, infrared saunas. And I know more and more health professionals are talking about, I'm sitting at home podcasting from my infrared sauna. Like, mm -hmm. is it is it worth doing? Are we seeing like significant changes for people when, and by the way, I'm not podcasting from my infrared sauna right now. Um, mm -hmm. are, we, are we seeing significant changes in those, um, in those people who do that consistently? Definitely. The research on saunas is, uh, it's, it's incredible. There are so many, so many health benefits for saunas. 
Uh, the main benefits in terms of detoxification and toxins, there are many other benefits, but the main benefits for regards to tox- detoxification are the persistent uh, pollutants. So that's actually a really great segue to the next um, uh, category of toxicants. So we talked about the non-persistent toxicants, the ones we're able to clear rapidly, but we're still exposed to. So we want to be able to clear them even more rapidly, uh, whatever we can't avoid from our environment. The persistent pollutants, these are things like heavy metals. Uh, these are things, like, certain heavy metals like, like lead, mercury, um, beep, uh, sorry, um, a flame retardants, for example, um, anything that's fast soluble. So it's certain things like um, chlorinated pesticides, uh, PCBs. Saunas have been shown to be really, really effective at pulling out these fat soluble toxicants. So they come out in the sweat. Some of them will come out into the blood and they'll actually recirculate in the blood. Your liver and your body may not be able to process these toxins, so they sometimes go back into the blood from the fats, from the storage, and then they go back into the storage. So we don't want, you gotta be careful with saunas because they can actually get people to uh, get re-exposed to those toxins and they can get sicker temporarily. So be careful if you do go to sauna and you feel worse, that's not a good sign. It means you might be too toxically burdened and you're reintroducing some toxins back into your blood and you're not really able to tolerate that. But what you want to do is you want to get the, the sweat out. You want to get the toxins out slowly. And then you want to, what you want to do is you want to go and take a cold shower for 30 seconds, you know, every 5 to 15 minutes, uh, depending on how hot. Or you, you kind of want to do a longer, lower heat to a moderate or maybe even high heat sauna. But you want to do a little cold shower in between a few times and wipe down in between, go back into the sauna, and then the very last bit when you end the sauna, after a half hour to an hour, depending how long you're feeling comfortable for, then you go ahead and shower, cold shower, and then you wipe down, and then you use a, a nice clean soap to get the fat soluble toxicants off your skin. Because if you don't, they're gonna be on the surface, they're gonna stay there in the, on your skin and they'll just get reabsorbed. It's, it's kind of like putting a bunch of olive oil on your body and going quickly into the shower and then trying to wash it off in 30 seconds without soap. That oil is not gonna come off very well. You really gotta use a good amount of soap. So you wanna use soap after your sauna to really make sure you wash off that surface uh, 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 to- chemicals and toxins that are coming out. But it's very effective. Um, I did mention metals in that persistent pollutants, like mercury and lead, some of them, they do come out in the sweat, not very effectively, but they do come out. There are different, you know, different uh, methods that you got to do if you do have persistent toxicants like heavy metals. Um, that requires a different treatment. Sauna will help, but it's, but it's a lot of these other ones that I mentioned that really, really come out and really, um, sauna is very, very effective at clearing those toxicants. And does it have to be an infrared sauna? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. So um, infrared sauna is very effective. It's very useful, especially, especially if it's easy. You can buy one from home, you know, plug it in. It's uh, you spend between two and five thousand um, dollars. You want to get a really good, clean quality, not um, a sauna that doesn't like off gas, doesn't use any chemicals, for example, doesn't use a lot of high EMF, um, you know, um, equipment in there for the for to create the infrared. But all of the research, what well, the majority of the research has actually been done on, you know, in, in Finland and in, in the, the Finnish uh, saunas, the ones that are just the dry saunas with, uh, you know, adding a little bit of water once in a while possibly, but just that, that, just that, that dry sauna. A lot of research has been done on that. And that, that's actually very effective, possibly more effective than the infrared. Um, don't know for sure, but, you know, not everybody has, you know, access to the, the dry sauna and sometimes just getting an infrared sauna is the best thing to get for your home to put it in a corner somewhere and, and then start your detoxification support. And for those people who are like, oh, geez, I've renovated. I'm like living near a highway. I'm in a city. I had a house with mold who are now freaking out and are like, I don't have room for a sauna or the budget for a sauna. Mm-hmm. Should we be detoxing? Like, is there a way to is there a way to do that? Should we do it seasonally? What's your take on it? Yeah, so for the idea specifically of you know de- doing a detox, like a cleanse, uh, yes, like definitely you, you want to try to do, my recommendation is to do it you know, once, twice, three times a year. It really depends how, how sick you feel, how many symptoms you have, or how long do you want to live? How, if you're in great health, like how long do you want to continue this optimal health? A few times a year is, is very, very beneficial to do a focused cleanse uh, with your naturopath, your doctor, or if you already know how to do a good one, to just to do a safely um, 
to a really good safe cleanse where you don't really overexpose yourself to chemicals as these things are coming out. But also the other thing you should be really doing is at this ongoing cleanse, you know, by by taking these certain nutrients to allow your body to pee out and poo out more of these, you know, toxicants. Um, by doing even minor little, like visiting your friend if they have a sauna in their condo or at the gym, and once in a while, just do a little bit, even throughout the whole year. You don't have to do you don't have to do a dedicated, you know, two weeks to a month of a cleansing protocol, and then you're set for the year. You kind of have to do this on an ongoing basis. Uh, that that's that's actually very very important to make sure you don't get toxic for six months of the year, and then you spend one week or two weeks to cleanse that's not really going to be effective for a lot of people. You kind of have to have this as a lifelong, you know, year-long thing on a gradual level, and then with these punctuated, more significant cleanses, if that, if that is an option for you, if you're able to do that. On October 26th and 27th, we're doing something really special in Toronto. For those of you who have been hanging out on the Anthropology podcast for a period of time, you know that we are driven by the mission that when people are well, they can change the world. On October 26th and 27th, I'm going to be hosting an event in Toronto called Impact Lives. This event has been designed for clinician entrepreneurs and wellness entrepreneurs in general who want to learn how to amplify their business. We are bringing in keynote speakers from across North America and implementation session leaders to help you not only become more inspired with respect to your business, but to learn new skills that you can start to implement right away. Whether you want to launch your own podcast, write your first book proposal, or create a system for patient acquisition or new clients that takes your business to the whole new level, we have got your back. Impact Lives is a two-day event taking place at the Globe and Mail Centre in downtown Toronto in a stunning venue that overlooks the city. It's going to bring together 150 passionate entrepreneurs looking to take the lives of their families, themselves, and the people that they work with to a whole new level. For those of you who have been loyal listeners, I would love to have you there. There is a coupon code that I am releasing just for listeners of the Anthropology Podcast. That is Anthropology20. And if you go to impactlivesevent.com, you can use that coupon code to receive 20% off the ticket price for the event happening in October. I cannot wait to see action takers, go-getters, and anthropologists like yourselves there when we gather together for Impact Lives. Well, what a perfect way to segue to the second portion of the interview where we get less focused on the the big things and more about the consistent things that happen in our lives every day. And I, I call this section our key performance indicators or KPIs. And so these are rapid fire questions for you. So we get a little bit more insight into um, some of the things that are important in, in your lifestyle and your health. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Do you have a consistent evening routine? And if so, can you share? Um, I don't have a consistent evening routine. I have more of a consistent morning routine, personally. It's um, I wake up, I um, you know take my shower with my you know uh, my shower filter for, so I don't expose to the chlorine and other chemicals. I make my my morning smoothie, as I mentioned, like the broccoli smoothie that I have with broccoli sprouts, um, organic blueberries, a few other more maybe more than a few other um, you know nutrients high quality nutrients detoxification support take my actually let me go back a little bit further i take my glutathione when i wake up that's the first thing i do to take it an empty stomach so i wait about you know 20 minutes a half hour hour before i do my smoothie and drink that and then i go ahead and make my uh, my smoothie so take everything i need to support all those pathways to get through the day and then um, sometimes i make my uh, like bulletproof coffee or bulletproof, you know, uh, matcha, which is with the MCT oil, some uh, potential, some grass-fed um, organic butter sometimes to support my brain function, and then go through my day. And I really should have a nice evening uh, uh, protocol. Uh, my goal for that would be come home a few times a week and use the sauna more regularly. I would love to get into a habit like most of my patients would. You know, three to five times a week would be amazing to use a sauna. But, you know, if I can get away with even once, then once or twice, then I'm happy about that. Um, and then I should be taking my evening supplements like most of my patients or most of the people are doing. Uh, but I don't – and 
my patients always tell me they're not consistent with their evening supplements. So it seems to be a human nature thing. We're good in the morning. We're not as good in the evening to maintain that. Uh, but yes, I would definitely love to have my evening uh, detox supplements on a more of a regular basis and then doing that sauna in the evening as well. Fiction or nonfiction, what are you reading right now? Uh, currently, I'm actually reading uh, nonfiction. Uh, interestingly, Dr. Walter Crinian's book, his, he just published, uh, him and Dr. Joseph Rizzono, a clinical environmental medicine book that just re got released two weeks ago. And that's actually what I'm reading. Um, it's um, a summary of what well, his newest research, he put this together for clinicians uh, and for students as well, of uh, the newest, newest research on environmental medicine. So that is actually, my, that's currently on my desk right now. And then I'm hoping to get through it. It's a pretty big book, but it's, it's, it's a very, very excited to get through this book right now. Well, I picked up that book from Walter when I was in San Diego last month, and uh, it's not lying. It is like an inch and a half thick, and it's dense, and it's it's awesome. Like it's really thirty five years of his his work and the most current research related to environmental medicine. So this is this is no joke. This reading. Yeah. No, this book. Uh, what I was really impressed is I've looked at some of those chapters. You know, there may be a chapter for you know. Uh, uh, seven to 15 pages, let's say. And then the chapter might be 10 pages, but then the references at the end of the chapter is 15 pages. So there are more references at the end, uh, uh, clinical studies and you know, research articles on each chapter than the actual uh, uh, text that's in there. So it's, it's definitely, definitely heavily researched. It's scientifically um, you know, um, based evidence on environmental medicine, it's all there. So it's not just something that we've been doing for years and years. This is all published and all things that doctors and um, doctors and the average person really, really need to know, whether you're a medical doctor or a naturopath or a chiropractor, it, it's out there, it's published, but it's not taught in school. Like we know this, a lot of, you know this, a lot of our colleagues don't know about environmental medicine. A lot of medical doctors don't know about it. It's, it's not their fault, it's not my fault. I didn't know about it, it's just not taught. So this book, if you're a doctor, Look it up. Uh, get it for yourself. It's called Clinical Environmental Medicine by Dr. Walter Crinian and Dr. Uh, Joseph Prezorno, and it's published by Elsevier. It, it'll change the way you uh, perceive uh, your, 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 your patients, your practice, and your, and your life, uh, the way your lifestyle. What is the one thing you're most consistent with with respect to your health? Probably the smoothies uh, that I was just mentioning. They're kind of, I need them. Most of my patients need them as well. Uh, I have I have almost everything I need there for to survive. If I just have that smoothie in the morning, um, and then I forget to eat or I don't need to eat for the rest of the day, then I have all my antioxidants. I have my mitochondrial support, my immune support, my um, neurological uh, support. You name it, uh, it sort of gets me through the day. And I'm I'm actually fairly consistent with that one for the last you know five, six, seven years. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? Um, well, uh, one of the things that people don't really know is that I, I love to travel and I used to do some heavy duty um, traveling in nature. Like I would, I'd, I'd love to go for like months at a time. A friend and I did a three month you know, trip. We, we slept in um, pretty much in, the, in his car. We were 21. We just we just graduated recently from university, and we just took three months. We we traveled for three months, went to 25 national parks from Alaska down to like Mexico, and just hiked between you know 10 and 30 kilometers up and down mountains every single day, um, and just lived on like we were young, right? We had no money. We lived on pretty much $500 a month each wow. bu uh, a budget. And that was just like, that was food, shelter, um, you know, uh, camping gear, whatever it was. Everything we, we, we lived on one, one dollar to two dollars a month, sorry, sorry, a week for our budget for fruits. That, that was our fruit budget, one to two dollars a week. Um, <laughs> so we had such a good time and we just like lived just like nomads, you know, living in all these national parks. And I, I would just love to go ahead and continue doing something that in the future when I, you know, take a year sabbatical or something. And just, um, but of course, I would eat a lot healthier this time around because I know a lot better. Uh, but uh, yeah, just just like really pushing myself uh, to be, you know, ex in ex sort of extreme natural nature environments uh, and um, connecting with with the world around me.
I love that. And when we know better, we do better. And that's, that's why we, that's why we do this podcast. Last question for you, entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? So I, I think maybe a combination, but a lot of us um, learn to be this way uh, because it's, we start to realize that we want to do more, you know, in our lives sometimes than sort of the everyday um, you know, habits and jobs and things that we're sort of raised to sometimes believe in. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes realize that we have something more in some areas than other people because we're all individuals, we're all unique, we all have our strengths. So when you have, when you find your strength, you want to share that. You want to get out there and and get it to as many people as possible. So um, entrepreneurs, I think, are people who uh, generally have a very very strong passion in one or two areas. And they realize that one of the best ways to, you know, maybe make a living is to do something that you love and, um, and something that will help other people. Like the best entrepreneurs, I believe, are the ones that are trying to help uh, society in general. So if they have something that's useful for their family, their friends, they may realize, you know what, this is useful for everybody. I want everyone to have this. And that's what makes you successful is that you have something that's very beneficial and you wanted to get it to everybody. And the side benefit is you, you know, you might be able to make a living out of it and make it maybe a very good living. And that's really the best feeling uh, for people to, to combine those two things in their life. Dr. Aviad Elgez, what a pleasure having you. So much incredible information. This is definitely an episode people are going to have to listen to more than once. Where can people go to find out more about what you are up to? Uh, the best uh, way to find out more about me or to contact or reach me is through the, my, my clinic's website. So my clinic is called um, EnviroMed Clinic. And um, if you go to www.enviromed.com, um, so that's E-N-V-I-R-O-M-E-D, like medical, dot com, uh, you'll be able to find some information about, you know, how, what kind of tests we can do. We do work with a lot of medical doctors as well to provide some of these tests, some of these treatments um, in the GTA area. So we have a really good network of uh, professionals and uh, other practitioners um, that we team up with to provide this service because it's not just me. It's not just a few naturopaths. It really does involve a team of people that can look for all these different areas and then what do you do about it? How do you implement these changes? So you can find out more uh, at that website. Incredible. Thank you so much for being here. I learned so much and uh, I can't wait to do this again soon. Okay, thank you very much. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.